A reading from Matthew's Gospel, the second chapter, verses 1 through 12. Listen for God's word. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, asking, Where is the child who has been born king of the Jews? For we observed his star at its rising, and we have come to pay him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened, and all Jerusalem with him. And calling together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it has been written by the prophet, And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who is to shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called for the wise men and learn from them the exact time when the star had appeared. Then he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word, so that I may also go and pay him homage. When they had heard the king, they set out. And there... Ahead of them went the star that they had seen at its rising until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw that the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. On entering the house, they saw the child and Mary, his mother, and they knelt down. And paid him homage. Then, opening their treasure chests, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for their own country by another road. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Does Epiphany end the Christmas season with an exclamation point or a question mark? The answer, I suppose, depends on what we think is happening here with these wise men and their gifts, the star they are following, a petty and jealous king named Herod, strange dreams of warning and a journey home by another road. Now, I think for many of us, the, perhaps most of us, the events of Epiphany get merged into the celebration of Christmas itself. The wise men, the gold, frankincense, and myrrh are actually the final scene in the Christmas drama, the last act of the play. A number of years ago, I went to see the uh, Christmas Spectacular at Radio City Music Hall in New York. If you have never been, I highly recommend it. It's one of those delightfully warm and perhaps even pleasantly tacky Christmas celebrations that seem to somehow be able to bring together a little bit of everything for everybody. The conclusion of the show is the most dramatic part. A narrator reads a story called This Solitary Life, and there is a marvelous procession of shepherds and angels and wise men all coming forward to pay homage to the newborn king. Now, it was a big production. It was quite showy. 
But in some ways, it reminded me of the Christmas pageants we used to have in the little Presbyterian church I grew up in just north of Spartanburg, South Carolina. The children were the actors, of course. And we would begin the chaotic practices several weeks before Christmas. Now, the smaller children would be assigned the role of the animals, mostly uh, cattle and sheep. And all they really had to do was stand around the manger scene or hang out with the shepherds. The next oldest group of children would be the shepherds themselves. They had no lines, but they did have to at least look interested when the angel came and spoke to them, as well as be able to move in some sort of coherent fashion from the field, which is over to the right of the sanctuary, to the manger, which of course was right there in the middle in front of the pulpit. The remaining parts were reserved for the older kids. There was Mary and Joseph who really didn't have to say a lot, but did have to be able to sit still at the manger for a good while. Incidentally, baby Jesus was always a doll. There was the angel who actually had the most lines, the the part about, fear not, for I bring you good news of great joy, and so on. And then there were the wise men who had to say in unison, Where is he who is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. And then they had to move over, bow before the manger, and present their gifts. Now, that was the big moment, of course. Because the arrival of the wise men, just like at Radio City Music Hall, meant that the play was building to its climax. At that point, we would all stand up and sing something like, Oh, come all ye faithful, and then we would go down to the basement for fellowship and snacks. Now these type of celebrations, celebrations like the one at Radio City or even the one in that little church in which I grew up, I'll answer my opening question by saying most emphatically that Epiphany ends the Christmas season with an exclamation point. The Prince of Peace is here. The King of Kings has arrived. The angels have appeared. The shepherds have visited. And even a bunch of truth seekers have shown up all the way from Mesopotamia bringing expensive gifts to pay homage to Emmanuel, God with us. So yes, when we think about it that way, Epiphany is the exclamation point for Christmas. But frankly, I have my doubts about that conclusion. I have my doubts because of the way this passage ends. Think about it. These wise men have been studying the stars for years, looking for a sign. And finally, they get it. And while the Bible doesn't exactly tell us this, it kind of hints about it, but tradition has held that they journeyed for at least two years seeking this child, a child whose birth had been prophesied about in a faith tradition completely different from their own. Finally, after all of this study, After this long and arduous journey, they get to their destination, they drop off their gifts, and then they head right back home by another road. All of that study, all of that travel, And they stay for five minutes, mount their camels, and go back. You know, that hardly sounds like an exclamation point to me. In fact, it sounds a lot more like 
a question mark. And I am left with a lot of questions myself. Why didn't they stay longer? Did their visit make any difference in their lives? Did all of this, the manger, and the baby, and the angels, and the shepherds, and even a bitter old king named Herod, did any of this make any difference at all? And does any of this make any difference to us? You know, I, I think the fact is, most of us, or at least many of us, are just like the wise men. After Christmas, we have to go back to the lives we were living before Christmas came and went. And so do all of the other characters in the Christmas story. James Van Tholen puts it like this. So now, Christmas is over. And strangely enough, life is back to normal. And not just for the folks from out of town. The angels, well, they have returned to the realms of glory. The shepherds are back in the fields. The inn has a few vacancies now. Christmas has come. Jesus is born. But Joseph and Mary are still the same people with the same problems. They aren't living with this Prince of Peace son of theirs in a palace or a mansion. They still have that census to take care of. They still have bills to pay, a wedding coming up, and now a child to raise. And now on top of all of these things, all because the Magi had to stop for directions, now they've got Herod on their backs as well. And that's really the hard part of this story. The hard part of this Christmas story. The part about what happens next. I didn't read those verses today, but I think most of you know what's coming. When Mary and Joseph and Jesus have to flee for their lives to Egypt, when bitter old King Herod orders the systematic slaughter of all the children in Bethlehem under the age of two. You see, the hard part of the Christmas story has to do with what happens after Christmas. For the characters in our play, yes, but also for us. What happens to us after Christmas? What happens after the meals are eaten and the gifts have been given and the friends and family have gone and the decorations have been put away and we are faced with the prospect of going back to the lives we were in the middle of living before all of the celebration gave us a momentary respite. What happens then? And maybe we begin to see that Epiphany really does end the Christmas season with a question mark. What now? What next? What is our answer? I think the answer lies in what the wise men did. 
Yes, they went back. Yes, they went back to their lives, but note this. They went back by another road. Did you notice that? They went back by another road. You see, no matter what romantic or sentimental notions we might have about Christmas, the truth is that when it is over, we do have to go back to the world and back to our lives. But because of Christmas, we go back with a question in our hearts. And it is this. Do we go back by the path we have walked before or do we go back by another road? Herod, of course, chose the same road he had been walking. Threatened by Jesus' claim to authority, he chose to do everything he could do to wipe out any chance of Jesus making a difference. Instead of choosing to bow down and worship this new king, he chose to try and kill him. And lest we think we are incapable of such a thing, Van Tolen reminds us that we too prefer to run our own little kingdoms. We too can resent the idea of there being a new king in town. A new king who demands our worship and our praise. In fact, it just may be that our problem all along has been that we have tried to run our own lives, our own little kingdoms, and that is the very reason we find ourselves in the mess we are in. That is the very road we have chosen to walk. But you know what? That is not the only road available to us. We can go home by another road. After all, what is an epiphany? Do you know? An epiphany is a sudden and new way of seeing reality. A sudden and new way of being and existing that is completely apart from and different from what has come and what has been before. And that's exactly what happened that first Christmas. Everything that had happened before was changed and remade and reborn. All because God chose to come and live and dwell among us in Jesus Christ. We can, of course, try and ignore this. We can go back and try to live the lives we were living just like Christmas never happened. Or or we can go home by another road. Now that doesn't mean that we won't have problems and pain and suffering to deal with. All of those things are just as real now that Christmas is over as they were before. Our lives go on for us just as they went on for Joseph and Mary and the shepherds and the wise men. 
We go on with our lives and we are tempted to forget about what happened in Bethlehem. We go on with our lives and we face sickness and pain. And we make mistakes and we sin. And we let each other and God down. And yes, that might cause us to weep. But if we go home by another road, we also go home with the knowledge that we do not weep alone. We weep with, with Mary and Joseph. We weep with those shepherds and the wise men. We weep with all of those whose lives have been touched by Jesus Christ. And we know this. We know that one day we will go home. And join with all of them in bowing down before the one who made us and who saved us and who is with us even now. That's what happens when we go home by another road. That's what happens after Christmas. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.